All right. So we are joined here today by two awesome guests, uh, two industry experts, um, two people I really admire. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So we're joined here uh, by Dr. Kim Cavett and Carl Strom. So Kim, why don't you lead us off? Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Kim Cavett. I am an audiologist uh, by training. I been an audiologist since the late 1980s, I guess. Um, spent some uh, the first like third of my career in in hardcore clinical services. I could say I've done everything in audiology once except for VEMPS. Um, and then I I got like a skill set in coding and reimbursement and compliance. And so for the last 24, 21 years not 21 years, 19 years, I have been uh, the owner of an audiology consulting business that works in training and coding and reimbursement and compliance. Awesome. Carl? Um, I'm Carl Strum. I'm the editor of the Hearing Review. Um, I have been reporting on hearing health care issues for over 25 years. We started the magazine back in, um, in January of 94. And um, and prior to that, I was into marketing. I was in um, uh, the window and door industry as a, as mm. a marketing manager, as well as um, uh, a stint in uh, specialty lubricants, which sounds salacious, mm. but actually <laughs> was in the automotive after, aftermarket industry. Um, I, was mar I was a marketing and sales, um, uh, sales support guy there, uh, technical writer. Um, and I've also worked uh, in publishing prior to that with uh, Advanced Star. Um, so, uh, so I, I've been in the industry now for uh, 25 plus years, and um, I am a statistics nerd, and uh, uh, I, uh, I, I look forward to our discussion, and thank you for having me, Dave. So, so you're a statistics nerd? That's awesome. I'm a statistics nerd. I'm a data nerd, too. And are we're going to totally geek out here. Yeah. Are you a baseball guy, too? Because I you am. have to. Yeah, so you have to I'm a stratomatic <laughs> baseball fan. We played stratomatic baseball throughout my entire life. So, so did my husband. And his little small claim to fame is when Nate Silver, if you don't know who Nate yep. Silver is from 538, Nate Silver used to live here in Chicago. And my husband used to be in a baseball geek club with Nate Silver <laughs> and they used to meet at the Giordano's on Belmont and and nice. drink beer and talk about baseball statistics <laughs> that's hilarious that is awesome yeah that's how nerdy my husband is a super baseball nerd because he's a he works in big credit and stuff so he's a big <laughs> data nerd so, too. so a Cubs fan I'm guessing uh or, season or Season ticket holder oh, really? since uh, 1999. Yes. All right. Yeah. Well, we yeah. got Cubs, Cardinals, and uh, yeah. Carl. What are you? Twins. Twins. Yes, okay. twins. I could be a Twins well, fan. To, I'm, I've, we've taken the place of, of the Cubs with the with, the, <laughs> with 18 consecutive uh, uh, playoff losses. So the, it, we, we're we're start, we're trying to claim claim fame to. Uh, to the uh, desperate, desperate losers. <laughs> I, I could be a Twins fan, though. I got to tell you, I could be a Twins fan. Yeah. Well, cool. All right. So um, I'm really glad you two joined, you know, for everybody that's listening. Uh, you know, when I first kind of started to come into this industry full time in 2016, these were two people that I really immediately recognized as being two of the most, um, I think, intelligent people within the industry and, and just uh, progressive thinkers in terms of where the industry is going. Uh, Carl, you know, being the editor for uh, his publication and then Kim with her newsletter, um, two things that I've been reading for a while now and it's really influenced the way that I think about kind of the way this whole industry is evolving. And so what I wanted to do for this conversation today to kick things off, I think it's gonna be kind of just a wide spanning conversation about all kinds of different audiology related topics and in the industry and in the state of it and how it's sort of evolving. Um, I wanted to highlight an article that each of them have written recently that I thought was really good and good fodder for us to sort of lead into a broader discussion. So Carl, I want to start with your article. You wrote a piece called Sound Quality as the Tipping Point for Younger, Milder Hearing Loss Market. In there, you had a lot of really interesting takeaways. So I'm not going to steal your thunder. I'd let you just go ahead and sort of share the gist of the article and some of your you know, kind of key takeaways from it. Well, I started off, um, thank you, David. Uh, um, uh, 
I started off talking about how back in the late 90s, um, I was on a, uh, this uh, after convention boat tour and a hearing aid manufacturer, an owner of a hearing aid manufacturer was really excited for me to listen to, the, um, to their new hearing aid. He was particularly excited about the sound quality of the hearing aid and I listened to it and I, you know, it was better than, than you know, cleaner than a lot of the other hearing aids that I had, uh, that I listened to before. But I had the same kind of um, uh, excitement in that it still kind of sounded, it sounded like a 1990s hearing aid, it, 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 um, which is to say a little bit like listening, not, not as bad, but listening through a kind of a telephone, you know, that kind of electronic-y sound to it. And, um, and more recently, uh, particularly, you know, sound quality has, has evolved and gotten a lot better through, the, through time, but in particular, in the last couple of years, um, the sound quality of, of hearing aids has really changed vastly. And um, uh, it, you know, I've, I've, I've been monkeying around with um, the Paradise and, uh, and uh, the, the White X Moment. And, and I've also been listening to others uh, at convention floors. And these hearing aids are uh, really pretty much transparent. I have a flat hearing loss. Uh, it's about 20 to 25 dB uh, uh, to about 4,000 Hertz. And then it, then it tails off pretty significantly. Um, so I'm kind of right in the wheelhouse yeah. of this mild, moderate hearing loss uh, uh, category. I have trouble hearing and noise. I have trouble listening on the on the TV, you know, on TV, or I want to turn it up too loud when when my kids and and uh, and my wife are, are are in the room. So I have a lot of the typical problems of, of a mild person with mild hearing loss. What really struck me about um, trying out these hearing aids is that they're acoustically transparent. That is that I don't notice when I have them on anymore. Um, and I couldn't say that two or three years ago. Um, I think several things, you know, I don't know if we wanna go into the technology of that, but you know, I think the receivers have, have, have really improved and the processing obviously is really improved in the hearing aids too. And, and we're starting to catch on um, Maybe in some in some cases to more linear uh, linear amplification, like Mead Killian always has been talking about for 25 years. Um, I won't go into it, but at any rate, they're they're a lot better than they were before. So in the, you know in this article, I um, I talked about how um, some of the some of the problems, traditional problems we've had in getting into that mild hearing loss market. Obviously, tra acoustical transparency and sound quality is a, is a big one and, and is kind of, I think, one of the last hurdles. But we still have a, a, a fair number of hurdles remaining. Um, you know, dispensing professionals have been taught, you know, have been literally taught to, you know, if you have a pure tone um, that's under, you know, whatever, 25 dB or whatever that, that you, you you're probably not a candidate for a hearing aid. And it's okay to tell people that, but you really, I think you really need a needs assessment and, and, a, and a real, you know, a hearing and noise and, and a, a real um, hearing assessment to, to determine whether or not a person has a problem. Somebody doesn't wake up in the morning and say, gee, you know what I'd like to do? I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to go down to an audiology office and have my hearing tested and spend, you know, $5,000. That, that's, that's not what, normal people do. Um, so, and Carl to interject. So what, and then when they do that, they've just literally told that patient that they don't have a problem. Right. And that there's no solution to that problem. They diminished. And then why would they go back? Right. Why would they go back into that type of setting? Why wouldn't they just, when they get home, go, I still got a problem. And then do it themselves. Right, right. It, it, you know, and it, and they came to you with a with a hearing problem, and it, and I think I, I think it really this kind of really strikes to one of the things we might want to talk about is um, is the mild is the mild loss market really our market? And and I think I think there's plenty of people for all intents and purposes. There are plenty of hearing care practices who are doing a lot of business 
and who are set up for, um, you know, really well in their communities and don't, you know, at least at this point, don't need to, to, to worry about mild hearing loss. Um, you know, I, I, I think I'm not trying to tell people what their business model should be. And that's what I want to impress, you know, make sure that people know is, is I'm not trying to tell you what you should do in your business. You know what you should know what you want to do in your business. What I'm saying, though, is that I think the field of audiology and hearing healthcare in general should be solving hearing problems. And, and those hearing problems are comprehensive from cradle to grave hearing problems that could include vestibular and could include myeloss loss and could include tinnitus and could include any, you know, if you think you have a hearing problem, I think we're, we're the place where you ought to be able to go. Even if you end up referring somebody and saying, you know, uh, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily carry this product or whatever. Anyway, well, let's talk about that in, in a little bit, maybe. But, um, you know, and it also boils down to the, that classic conversation. I think, Kim, you might have been in on that one um, at uh, ADA meeting um, where there's the retail versus the medical model and, and which one are we. But, um, yeah. Uh, but that's the, the, that's that's one issue. The, you know, the other thing is that hearing aids, hearing aid manufacturers um, have made some really good products for um, the mild loss and economy market. And um, and there's always this, you know, this. What generally happens is that people adopt, or the dispensers end up adopting these for their lower, for their economy market, and and. They're, the dispensers are are leery about them cannibalizing um, their profit margins, and so they yeah. use these these things that are meant to be for mild losses for their baseline um, uh, uh, economy and basic aid. So I want to jump in there, but that's because they've set up a business model that's based upon some calculation of invoice rather than a business model that I have fixed prices based upon my break even plus profit needs for the care I provide. And then the product is just the product. So you're right. gonna make the same money for your time, regardless of the product you dispense. And now you're just giving the patient the product that they really need. Because we know from studies from from Harl at the University of Memphis, it's been replicated at University of Iowa, that's been replicated at Indiana, that's been replicated at Northwestern, that these studies show that the vast majority of patients, all they need are somewhere between six and eight channels, some form of compression, some sort of feedback management, directional microphones, and a telecoil. And and not not yeah not only that but you know, <laughs> that, that that very same with Robin Cox it, it said um, you know the I think the everybody was a Twitter because the the study pitted you know will you will you see improvement from a you know from a high premium level hearing aid compared to a to a basic level hearing aid and what they found was that um, with a giant caveat here. What they found was no, there isn't there isn't difference in terms of of the benefit that you can receive from them. But the real problem, the the real thing they found was that any good hearing aid fit with using best practices will give you great benefit. And, yes. <laughs> and, and, and and all the other and there's tons of you know we know that connectivity and rechargeability and all these other great things. Um, it, you can you can pay you can pay a premium for those things if you're if you're the consumer and that's and that's great and I, I, you know trying these new products out it's it's amazing you know I uh, I, th I think they're amazing hearing aids and, and they're worth the money my sister has has a, a a new hearing aid and she and she loves it she wears it all the time um, and it's a it's a premium aid but you don't necessarily need that to benefit from from here for, to get benefit from hearing aids and we need we need to be a field in my opinion we need to be a field where if somebody comes in and kim i'm going to steal i'm going to steal your phrase if somebody comes in with a 500 problem 
they shouldn't have to pay five thousand dollars to to have a solution. Of course, they can, mm -hmm. and and that's great. But but the but we should have solutions. Maybe not five hundred dollars, but um, I think. Oh, I want there to be five hundred dollar <laughs> solutions. But but there's a there's a price point there's a price point there for at least for your business uh, I would argue, and there's there's a lot of really good PSAPs. Uh, you know I I could name eight PSAPs anyway um, that uh, many of which that I've tried that are that are really quite good for my my mild hearing loss. Yeah. Again and if we go back to like 2015 2016 that's why ada partnered with intracon to make the ear venture product line so we could have a 500 dollars solution right. i mean that was the goal right. that's the whole thing that someone could be evaluated and fit to best practices at a 500 dollars a unit option right you know and i i would also like to like to clarify that i think you know, the FDA is is formulating these regulations for for OTC hearing aids, and and we you can certainly disagree, but I think at some point, whether it's 50 dB or or there's a number there somewhere, and I'm not an expert enough to tell you, but I don't think an OTC solution is going to be is is going to be applicable for somebody with more than a. a much more than a mild moderate loss. Well, I just think we just need to be honest with people that the reason why is you're going to run into coupler problems. So you're going to run into right. feedback. Right. That's what's going to happen. It's not that necessarily can you not get it the gain up enough. It's that you're going to run into feedback before you before you do. And oh, that's like, what, like they want to have these crazy things in the in the um, warnings about bloody ears, like that's the one that drove me over the edge. Why don't instead we warn people that when it squeals, when you have it in comfortably and it squeals, this is not the product for you. Right. Like let's go simple. Yeah. Rather yeah. than the bloody ear. I mean, I worked in otolaryngology for 17 years and I'm gonna tell you that the bloody ear is not that common. <laughs> yeah, I think that, you know, one of the ways that I'm looking at things right now is that, uh, Kim, you you touched on it earlier, but it's all it all kind of boils down to time. Time is, I, I think, sort of at the root of of everything right now. Because, again, you know, are we a widget based industry? Or are we a service based industry? And I think that all signs, and I think most of the professionals in the industry would they would say that they're you know it's a service based industry they're providing care they're providing you expertise. think so dave you really think that's what they think i carl what do you think i think that more of them see themselves as dispensers i don't uh, I, I i will disagree with you there kim uh, um i think you but, think but what what i would say is that the that to your point, the adherence of be to best practices, where everybody should be doing what they know they should be do doing, or, or if you have, if you've read it all, you know, I, I, I don't understand the disconnect between, between providing services and not adhering to best practices, you know, doing the real ear, uh, you know, having a hearing assessment, doing verification and valid validation, um, uh, doing speech and noise. Uh, that's that is essential services, and it, you know it gets back also to a point that I always tell my kids: AI is coming, and it's going to change everything. I mean, we're just we're just at the tip of the iceberg right now. If you can, if you're mm -hmm. doing anything that can be automated, watch out because it's going to go away. And and so you know, it, there's there's been a fair amount of talk about audiology returning to its rehabilitative resources. And I think that's a really healthy discussion. Um, I think you you would agree with that. Oh, absolutely agree with that. Uh, people ask me, you know, how, what do you see? Um, how, how can audiology have a good future? And I'm like, practice audiology. I mean, that's really audiology. The key to audiology success is the practice of audiology to its, it's fullest, ex to its fullest state defined ex this extent. And well, it's, it is the key to it's it's the key to a good hearing aid fitting. I mean, we, we all we all yes. know that seventy percent of uh, at least 75, 70, 70 percent of a successful hearing aid fitting 
And Robin Cox, again, that, that Harl study showed it. It, depend, it depends on what you do with the hearing aid in the person's ear and, and how you counsel them and, and, and how you bring them along on that, uh, on that better hearing journey, the customer journey to, uh, to, to, to find a successful outcome. And then to make sure that what they came in to have solved, if you can solve it, of course, is, is solved as best as you can. Yeah, and that we're going to see more, you know, I think Hume showed that yeah. to a degree in his study. But then conversely, Bose has shown that if you have the right algorithms and you have the right tools that people can't, some people can do things themselves. Right. I just see this as a continuum. And the rate, if we go back and we look at the data from, from optometry, when reading glasses went over the counter, prescription eyeglass sales increased. Right. Because people need a solution on their own kind of terms. And that's when I talk about accessibility. Our models problem is not just about price. It's about the things that we require of people that may or may not be necessary because we want to do it this way. Right. And let me just really quick segue here um, to the article that I wanted to highlight for you, Kim. Um, another really good article, Accessibility as an Opportunity. So you just started to touch on it there, but can you really expand on the premise of this article? Well, so if we go back and we look at what really drove the PCAS and what really drove the NASM report, it wasn't just about affordability. It was how, how easy is it to get, am, uh, to get a solution, amplification, some form of solution. And I think what we've been remiss about is we want to do it our way, that you need to come in and you need to do a hearing test a full audio with us mm -hmm. and you need to do, then you need to come back and you need to get evaluated again. And then you need to get, come back and you need to get fit. And then you need to keep coming back. Even if you don't have problems, we feel like you need to come back in. And we don't realize that if someone is, especially now they're doing homeschooling with their kids they're trying to manage work they're trying to maybe be a caregiver for their spouse or their parent or they're an hourly employee or an employee that this is pto in one big bucket and this isn't sick time what we're at we're asking them to take a day minimum all in a, a, an eight hour day to go down the journey that we've set that really, do we have any evidence that shows that it's the right journey? I mean, we don't even have evidence to show people were all upset about the US task force and that the whole hearing screening, we don't have evidence to show the hearing screen is valuable. So why do we insist on all of these things when there are studies to show now, whether we're looking at HEREX study from University of Pretoria or we're looking at stuff from Bose that can show, hey, people can do some of these things themselves, but we're just going to fight it. We're just going to fight it rather than take in, hey, maybe it's a good thing to have all your patients screen their hearing themselves before they get there. Right. Great well, qualify. Right. I, yeah, I feel like qualifies. I feel like, um, you know, the, the, the real sort of existential question that needs to be asked here by every professional is where does your value lie? And I think to your point, Kim, you know, it's this idea where, uh, you know, with the prescription glasses leading to our over-the-counter, uh, like cheaters leading to larger sales and prescription glasses, I feel as if if you make the technology more accessible, if you grow the market, even though you might actually not directly benefit from that, you're bringing more people into the market more or less. And I feel like that's going to be, I think, you know, kind of going off of what the whole thing with Bose, it's like, 
there might be an element of do it yourself to this. There might be a significant element to that, but I tend to think that there's always going to be a portion of the market that wants to go to an expert. They want somebody that can serve that consultative role to say, look, this is what your loss is like, and, and here's how we're going to rehabilitate it. And they're going to actually serve as that like consultative type uh, service. And for me, it's like, if, if that's the model where you can somehow find a way to make that viable, um, it doesn't really matter what you're selling product wise anymore, because, okay, if the product product is going to depreciate in its margins um, and you can be selling a $500 device making, you know, $150, or you can be selling a thousand dollar device and making $150 at the end of the day. um, What matters I think more is that the value that people are perceiving you to have is that you're the one that is more or less helping to guide them through that, that lifelong process that they're going to have. And they can, defer to you at, with any sort of consultative type questions or anything like that, that they have. Right. And they, maybe you didn't sell them anything and you made $150. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in my old life, we, we made, um, we covered all of our overhead and expenses with, with diagnostics alone. I mean, you just have to have some of it's private pay, some right. of it, and, and you have to behave like an expert. Yeah. Well, and that goes to your whole theme too about this accessibility piece, where if you make yourself more accessible, if you are conducive to people's hours and the remote element of things, you meet people where they want to be met rather than forcing them into your model. Uh, I feel like to your point, it's not, it, then it doesn't necessarily even become something attached to a product or anything like that. It's all based in time and it's on your expertise. And Carl was going to say something a minute ago. No, uh, um, a cu- you know, a couple things. I, I think I think teleaudiology and and all all of those facets are are really great things. It, not just for the pandemic either. You know, we're seeing teleaudiology kind of fade now back into the, into the background as as more and more face to face types of encounters with patients are are now tenable. But. Um, it's really vital for the future. Teleaudiology is, is something that everybody should be doing and particularly for baby boomers. It's probably, you know, there is a, and it's, I shouldn't say generation, it's person by person, but there are plenty of individuals who, who that's not gonna be applicable for. But, um, you know, I uh, I do almost all of my healthcare through, um, through texting back and forth, usually with uh, physician assistants. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's how I, that's how I prefer it. I've got two, two boys, they get ear infections and broken legs and st- snowboarding and, and, uh, you know, and, and so you're back, so you're back and forth, but it's really a convenient time-saving thing in, that, that baby boomers uh, really appreciate, I think, um, it, particularly, you know, people who are working and, and have a lot of demands on their time. So the, so that's one thing. Getting back to, um, uh, uh, you know, unbundling and, and all of that, the, the, the services, you know, I, I would also, I, I also have a, a an, you know, a, a lot of dispensing professionals uh, really, their you know their hair goes up on end when uh, if a hearing aid manufacturer starts to make noise about this OTC market, and and I would say that um, they shouldn't be insecure. You, you, your services are what are, are what drive your practice, or they should be. And I think, and and people, you're free to disagree with me, but I think that there's nobody more qualified than hearing aid manufacturers to to produce OTC hearing aids. They're the experts and they're the ones who are dealing with you all the time. So, so, so you know, they're with the dispensers all the time. So, the, so I, 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 I think they're, the, they're in the best position for our field to be, uh, um, to be producing all kinds of aids. Uh, and I, I, know, uh, I know there are companies who uh, adamantly did and, and, and uh, you know, people I've worked with for many, many years who adamantly dis- disagree with me on that uh, on that basis. But we're here to provide. I think our field should be here to provide hearing solutions. Well, I'm gonna 
agree and disagree. I think that they would be equally qualified. I think an Apple, I think a Amazon, I think a Bose, I think a company with a large, with, with unlimitedly deep pockets mm -hmm. and true to also tech, technological know-how in the audio space, I think that they could create an equally, um, a, 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 to an, a product at equal to anything any of those five hearing aid manufacturers could create. And maybe in full disclosure, I know Andy Sabin. I knew Andy Sabin when Andy Sabin from Bose was a PhD student. Mm -hmm. Andy could be the head of R&D at any hearing aid manufacturer in the world. For sure. Let's well, just call they're, it what they're, it is. You're right. And, and, there, and there's a reason he's there, right? I mean, there's a reason he's there because this was his theory. This was and his Diane theory. Van before, right? So. And Diane and what well, and Diane Van Tassel. And we can even go back to Mead to a degree. Right. In that mm. Mead, Mead. I love Mead. <laughs> I mean, I love Mead too. And and I think for me, I um it's my exposure to him, I think in my background, I, I went from exposure from working, I went to Indiana. So I had Larry Hume's undergrad and grad school. And I was actually in grad school with Laurel Christensen. So we go from that world to academic medicine. So like my old boss is the head of Mass Eye and Ear. And so I, I had to operate at kind of that kind of level. And then exposure, I go to Northwestern and I have this exposure to Mead and now to Pam Sousa and the work that you're doing and you just take it kind of all in. And I actually wrote, even in 2004, I wrote a support letter to the FDA for Mead's second petition. It was just, we're just so stuck in fighting and in not like looking ahead. And I'm with Dave that it's, and, and Carl, it makes me sad when people are getting away from telehealth. Why would you go backwards? Right. People, why don't you let your patient tell you what they want? Ultimately, we need, we need to, to meet the patient where they want to be met. And, where they want to be for met. Many of, and, and maybe for the majority of, of people right now, that's, that's not with teleaudiology. But for an awful lot of people coming down the pipe, it, it is. And, and for an awful lot of people right now who are seeking hearing solutions like, like myself uh, um, for mild losses and just uh, situational problems. You know, there's another, there's another one that, that I disagree with a lot. Of, you know, for a long time, the gauge of, of, where, of the success of a hearing aid is how long you wear the hearing aid. And, and, and there's something that I think we should also rethink. Yes, for a, for a real hearing problem, obviously we want people to be wearing a hearing aid for, for a long period of time, but there are situational losses, mild losses like my own, where, where you might just only need a hearing aid once in a while at a meeting or, or, or this, and, this and that. And we think that's, I, I would contend that that's, that that's something we should, we might want to rethink. It, hearing problems are hearing problems and and whether it's telephone te telephones or tv listening or whatever we should be involved in that we or, or at least right. be able to advise on that and i think i i'm very passionate about the evaluation process i think we need to have a stronger evaluation process that takes into account cognition and dexterity and processing and lifestyle and depression and everything to look at the whole person that it, it's more than an audio mm -hmm. the audio is just and and we also have to start to think because i i just did a thing uh, where i went to the i used to be an implant audiologist too so i'm very passionate about how underserved that population is for sure how many why that the hearing aid should just be i used to tell my patients the hearing aid is one of the tools in my toolbox it's not right. my only tool like, I love that. And that we have to start think more globally as to how to solve our patient's problem, even if it doesn't 100% involve me. <laughs> I, I think that like you just described right there, something that is so, so much harder to disrupt because you just listed off like 
10 different things that you're doing from a evaluation standpoint, right? Like these aren't things that necessarily a, an algorithm can replicate. An algorithm might be able to replicate something from a, a diagnostic standpoint, but if that's the only piece of value, if people are perceiving you as I go to you to get my hearing aids, then you're going to be much, much easier to be disrupted by these technology innovations and all of these new providers that are leveraging the internet in ways that I think people are kind of underestimating right now. And so I feel like if you can sort of change the perception to I'm going to, you know, we're going to have a lifelong relationship kind of thing where you're going to defer to me as your, you know, the expert for all of these things. I just, I think that that it completely alters the whole value proposition in the consumer's eyes, in the patient's eyes. And when you need me, not when I tell right. you, you need me. And I'm accessible to you through I, all of this right. new, these new right. remote elements. Um Another thing that I wanted to kind of touch on today that I've had a lot of discussions about offline and in person um, is another elephant in the room, you know, another thing that's sort of along the same vein as OTC, you hear a lot about these three PAs, right? These, um, comp these uh, patients that are coming in through these um, insurance providers. And I've talked to a lot of professionals before and they say that, you know, this is just unsustainable. I can't break even. I'm really curious to get your thoughts um, because it seems like this isn't going away. This isn't just some sort of fad. It's like, I think a very broad theme across a lot of different medical industries. Um, so just curious, like maybe are we thinking about this the wrong way and can businesses in this industry sort of uh, re um, align the way that they do business to be more conducive to this type of patient? This is definitely Kim, definitely in uh, uh, Kim's wheelhouse. But um, you know, I, I I would if if I if I might you know just put out there that I think everybody needs to know what your clinical hour um, per, uh, is worth. You know, I mean, what each one of your professionals in your in your office is worth, and then and then you have to back out and figure out what you can and can't do. But I'll let. I'll let Kim is the is the cert, certified expert in the in this area. Well, I should preface that for two years, from 1999 to 2001, I was the director of professional relations at HearPO, which is now Amplifone. I always forget the, those two years. Not that they were bad, because they were awesome, and they really I learned a lot. Um, the first thing I'll have to say is, and I I can tell many stories about what how I can substantiate this. Some of the reasons a TPA is in the space is because of the shenanigans of providers. And that providers were, um, I'll give an example. Um, I met with a Blue Cross plan and in a given state and they um, showed me claim after claim of hearing aids, $8,000, $10,000, And these patients had, $2,500 benefits. And how it was supposed to work is you were supposed to offer people something within their benefit. They were supposed to acknowledge that they were offered something within their benefit and then they could upgrade. But what happened is that it was a unionized employee and the unionized employee went to their union and said, you said I had a hearing aid benefit and they told me I owed $7,000. And so then the union complains to the blue and they couldn't control it. They couldn't control that upper limit. So they turned to a third party administrator. And that's what happened in my Here PO days with, with workers comp. I mean, Here PO had a huge workers comp contract with the Washington self insured over containing these upper level prices. And so some of it is on us. The second is we have to provide, we have to find out from these entities what care is in the bundle. And then we have to provide the evidence-based care around that, well, around that that's not in the bundle and private pay it, or when it's in it, can I afford to do it based upon my standard of care? And so sometimes the answer is gonna be no, you can't participate. Sometimes you can make it work because the way the program works, but we have to provide that evaluation that we're talking about, a true 
communication and functional needs assessment where you're looking at cognition and falls and depression and all of those things, that is not in that program. That's a diagnostic service. And you could private pay that, but you got to provide it. Right. And you have to be able by licensure to provide it. I mean, I've had a lot of beautiful things in my career. I've been blessed. My proudest thing is my licensure law in my state. We can do evaluation and management. We can do basic health screenings. We can do interoperative monitoring. We can do these things, but it takes boots on the ground to get these changes done so that your abilities to what your scope is open up. And everyone thinks, well, you're going to have a fight. No, I got the medical society on my side early on. You but you just have to try. We have to do the work, whether it's at the licensure level or whether it's at the care we provide. We have to do the work and we have to change the model. It's just not going to work anymore. Yeah. Okay, it's my soapbox, so I got off of it now. <laughs> no, I think that's actually, it's a really interesting point, though. And I think, like, this idea of changing the model, I think, is the theme. I mean, in so many different ways, it feels like that's at the, the root of everything right now. Is this? It's this, like, kind of the writing feels like it's on the wall. Like, it's like, whether it be with the three PAs or it be with OTC, um, or it be with all these new online providers, uh, it just seems like the status quo isn't really going to be relevant all that much more. And so the challenge I think is how do you adapt not to like use cliches, but how do you as a provider make yourself relevant in today's day and age? And again, I, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but it, I feel like it all comes back to this idea of you have to have a significant perception of value. And that value comes down to this idea of consultation and being an expert and this idea of charging for your time. Practice we've, ideology to its fullest scope. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've also, you know, I mean, uh, there's some also some interesting ideas, um, you know, for example, uh, Dan Qual and Brian Taylor have written for us on triaging patients. You know, right now, the way that, that things are set up um, a, a vast amount of your clinical time is consumed by a small percentage of your patients. Yes. And, and yet everybody pays the same. Um, and they have, you know, I've, um, I, I know uh, uh, Dan has um, proposed triaging patients, you know, and, and trying to classify them in, in various ways to, to try and delineate who is going, you know, who's, who's going to be, you know, an, a, the least clinical hours, a middle, you know, an average clinical hour and, and a lot of clinical hours. And, you know, generally that goes with severity of hearing loss, but it can be like Kim mentioned, um, you know, co some sort of cognitive uh, a, a test or, or something like that, that could put a lot of dexterity, a lot of things that, that go into that. Right. So, you know, be having unbundling and having a more fair system where um, where people who don't need your much services or as as you suggested, David, uh, you know, going out and getting your your own widget and bring it bring it in for for help and and individualized tuning or whatever. And again, that's where I think hearing aid manufacturers would really you know it benefit for our industry to be able to address those losses and kind of seamlessly move in between hearing aids, um, it makes a lot of, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like that. I like the theory of the triage. So I, I work in a mindset of, so in my own life, we triaged everybody on the phone before they at scheduling base and then your your appointment was set up based upon what your needs are from the triage so we triage the eight warning signs of ear disease plus tinnitus at scheduling and then you would build in that communication and functional needs assessment that could be done that day and it's really it's not an audio this is a true like you're doing inventories you're doing speech and noise you might do unaided real ear because that can help you pick your coupler you might take some of this might take you down a road of cognition or processing or dexterity and then you create a care plan and that care plan may include other professionals that care plan may include a widget and 
you guys should not be surprised. When I fit hearing aids, I didn't talk about makes, models, and styles and things with patients. I asked them a lot of questions and then I picked the hearing aid. Yeah. I mean, why are we going where the patient is picking the hearing aid? They don't know. Like I just even had my, my daughter's old uh, nanny who's part of our family. Her son just got a cochlear implant for a single-sided deafness and they made her pick the product. Like, are you kidding me? She didn't know. And so I helped her pick it. Yeah. Because, but that's what we're doing. We're letting, we're not being the, we're not owning the expert. Yes. And then you create a pricing structure where if I had a patient, a new patient, I would say, you know, you don't know what you don't know. A service plan might be good. But if I had a patient who'd worn hearing aids before, I'd look back at their old chart and go, you never came in. There's no <laughs> reason for you to buy this service. Right. And then you charge for your chunk of time. And I, you can code that. You can monetize that. You can bill that to insurance. But again, I, and I'm sorry if I sound frustrated, but I gave my first talk on unbundling, thir- I mean, 13 years ago. Wow. <laughs> and we're still in HLAA made that a priority in 2011 and we did nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just, um, I feel like sometimes I'm like hitting myself in the head with a hammer. But, but in fair, you know, in in fairness too, I mean, uh, um, the, the overall med, isn't the overall medical system, Kim, uh, kind of moving back toward an outcome based where it's more bundled. Well, yes and no. And what I would say by yes and no, um, that's some of the, some of the alternative payment models or a hospital outpatient perspectives payment system is in that bundled, but they haven't found yet that the outcomes are always superior in that type of model. I think what, what, what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing more in healthcare is a patient centric that you're taking a patient down a journey, whether you encourage them down this path or this path or this path, where they've had the most success is in that expert journey. And therein lies our, uh, lies our hugest opportunity. Right. Of, of, of being to demonstrate to general health care that hearing health care is essential, not only essential for, um, you know, reducing social isolation and loneliness, and depression, but also for for patients adhering to doctor recommendations because they can hear the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because they can hear the doctor. And I always, you know, um, I, my next door neighbor is a primary care physician who only works with low income senior citizens. And I'm constantly, he'll say his patients can't hear him. I'm like, then have you referred them? Like. This is like a vicious cycle of a conversation. I remember I saw a, uh, a, a study, it was conducted, it was a survey um, in the industry. I want to say it was Hearing Health That Matters conducted it, and it was across like a thousand different uh, professionals. And one of the things that just jumped out at me was the number one referral source, and this is probably no surprise to you two, is fellow medical professionals. Um, and so it seems like that, like you said, Carl, is a massive opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know that I've had Nick Reed on the podcast before where we talked about the, you know, Johns Hopkins Achieve trial. And I think that could be one of the most important uh, areas of research. I mean, if if it does validate that um, hearing aids do in fact help to mitigate the, the, you know, the spread of dementia or the rate of cognitive decline, um, I think then you get a whole lot more buy-in from general physicians, um, you know, going all the way back to what Kim said earlier, though, we have to validate that hearing screening is effective. Um, So something I wanted to ask you to, you know, being in the industry for a little while, um, and as somebody that hasn't been in here as long as you two, um, this feels like a game changing moment for me, but that just might be because I haven't been in here as long as you two. And I'm curious, like, is this in your opinion, is, are we at a moment in time right now where you get that sense that, Kim, to your point, you know, you you uh, you were talking about unbundling 11 years ago, um, and it's like you're beating your head against the wall. Um, nothing seems to really ever change. 
but you in light of the pandemic, in light of all of the sort of macro trends that were transpiring leading up to that, uh, you know, stemming from the, the PCAST and all of the OTC legislation, um, it just seems like there's a lot of different things that are sort of transpiring right now that sort of result in this impetus to change. And I'm curious, is this just like another another go or do you feel as if this is a moment where we are having where we are kind of in the midst of maybe some true change that this industry is undergoing or about to undergo my my opinion is is that you know obviously there's a you know the convergence all those things that you you talked about Dave, you know whether it's otc or big box or or three pas or um, and now, you know, just, just to make things really fun, we, we just threw in the pandemic, right? You know, <laughs> right. You know, teleaudiology and the blended model, you know, I think, uh, I, I think those are things that everybody's going to have to deal with. And I, you know, I, you know, one of my first writing assignments in 1994 was writing about how big bo uh, baby boomers were going to, to change everything. And, um, yeah. and uh, it took about 15 years after. So in other words, you know, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to predict when change will happen, but certainly financial pressure is the, it will be the, um, a, a big determining element of, of when that, when push comes to shove. And I think people with the OTC legislation and everything else, I don't think OTC is going to going to change everything. I, I, I don't think it's a it's a big threat. I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, but it it certainly changed. And just like big box exerted downward pressure on on ASPs, um, average sales prices, the um, uh, OTC will should have an effect, and so will um, three PAs. We can't um, managed care is. I, I see people, you know, in, in chat saying, "Oh, you know, we shouldn't do any managed care." Well, that's the way things are things are going. You know, in medicine and everything else. It's. I. I don't think we're going to be a. With all due respect to their arguments, I don't think we're going to be able to avoid it. Um, but we we need to do it in a way that um, hopefully, particularly with Medicare, um, doesn't put all private practices out of business and um, that it's done in the right way. I would agree with really everything Carl said. I mean, um, I think where we have been, two, two issues that we have at play here is um, and Carl will probably disagree with this, which is cool. Um, uh, the manufacturers have made it. Um, they have fought change. They have fought the changing of the model. Um, they have, um, they have any time that audiologists or dispensers want to explore changing doing this, doing that, whatever, they are ridiculed or um, they are dismissed by, by most of the manufacturers in these models. And I can say personally, the screaming that has been done at me by manufacturers and presidents of hearing aid companies over the years, I'm not their favorite person. Um, and I, I mean, I'm not gonna name names, but all of them have screamed at me at least once <laughs> or told me I'm stupid or delusional. Um, and then the, the second thing at play is that we've been really sadly reluctant to look at the change in, in all of retail and medic, medic, in the medical world. I think for me, I read a book, uh, I read, I'm a bit, I was a big Clayton Christensen fan before he passed. Oh, I love passed. Clayton Christensen, yep. And I think if you read his work, you really are struck by um, how all of this has been evolving because of technology mm -hmm. for the last like 20 years and we've been reluctant to evolve along with it. And again, I am going to blame the manufacturers some for this because they, they, they own clinics and they want to keep the model the way it is because that's what's best for them rather than what's best for 
their providers. I think they would cut providers out of the picture if they could. Um, and what I found to be really interesting in COVID is, as someone who was up on the hill fighting for OTC and they were fighting against self-assessment and they were fighting against all these things and now there's COVID <laughs> and they need these self-assessment tools and right. oh my gosh, they're now groovy. Mm -hmm. And I found it to just be really um, hypocritical and ironic. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll have the, uh, the alter argument here. I, you know, I, undoubtedly, Manufacturers, many of them are public companies, and and their their whole thing is to is to make a profit and and repair their share, repay their shareholders. All right, so it's not like there isn't that component to it. They're not altruistic um, uh, companies, that, that, but um, they're uh, they're run by people who understand that um, it's in their best interest. To have consumers um, coming uh, coming into the market, and like I said, I mean, it, it's not like they haven't tried to. Uh, in this, is just a, one example um, of you know, go after the mild hearing care market, but there are certain um, limitations that they can do it with with the professional dispensing market as well. Um, but Carl, then why did they fight OTC then? If that was really if that was really the a, a goal, and I, I, I actually agree with you, I think they should be wanting to expand the market and they should go, I want them to go into OTC. I'm all for it. Right. But why did they fight it so vehemently? I know, I was on the hill. <laughs> I, think, I, I think in a large part because, because they're, uh, you know, the, their customers, the dispensers were, were largely against it. Um, and uh, you know, even to, even today, many, there there are several manufacturers, almost all manufacturers, who say they're not you know they're not going to get into into o, OTC or or direct to consumer types of things. I personally think that's a that's a mistake, but um, but I don't you know uh, I, I think I think they're very sensitive to what their customers want. And, um, but, but I don't know that they are. Their customers want to be able to compete with a big box retailer. They want to be able to compete. So, and they want to be able to compete in a managed care marketplace. So if they are that into their customer, why don't they give their customer prices that they could compete or have the ability at a price to compete with a big box retailer or in their third party administrator role, which they own, many of these are owned by a manufacturer, why do they not make it so the provider gets reimbursed for their time regardless of the product, rather than tying this, if you do a low end product, you get $300, but if you do a high end product, you get 800. Right. That, mm, I have trouble with. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I, you know, I think I think this would be a good debate for uh, you and Carol Rogan or somebody or or, uh, or Kate Carr or somebody like that. But, but you know, ultimately, you know, you brought up you know volume, and I think that's that's a problem. We're we're segmented into a number of different buying groups, and we can't get the kind of volume together to be able to leverage the kinds of prices that that big box um, and mass merchandisers enjoy. Um, and, and uh, frankly, uh, you know, some of the networks and, and, and some of that. So the, uh, I, I don't, I, 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 I'm not going to be the, the face. I'm not the face of the industry. The, uh, oh, I know, uh, I know. But, but the, you know, I think there are, you know, looking, having been an observer of, you know, and having sympathies for both sides, I think, I think there are, um, mitigating arguments for uh, for each. Yeah, and for me though, is um, I feel like they have been, they have a role in why we haven't evolved. That is well, I think I, my I, bottom I, line. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, argue that at all. I mean, yeah. I think everybody's part of the problem. Probably I think everybody's part of the problem, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think everybody's part of the problem. I think those are fair points. I, I, I tend to agree with kind of everything uh, that was laid out there. And I, 
I mean, at the end of the day, what's in the past is in the past. And now it's a matter of how do we move forward? And um, speaking of moving forward, um, I'm curious, um, you know, with new technologies, this is in many ways a very technology oriented podcast. So I'm very obsessed with, you know, the state of technology. And Kim, I agree with you. I think Clayton Christensen, in Innovator's Dilemma is probably one of the books that has resonated with me like me the most throughout my entire life. Uh, the whole jobs to be done framework has kind of changed the whole way I look at everything. Um, and so thinking about technology, I agree. I think technology is is really at the, at the core of um, what's transpiring in terms of change and what we can expect to come. I think I'm really optimistic. I'm really, really excited about sort of, I think what's coming in the next 10 years. Um, what aspects of this industry, you know, from a technology, uh, new services, um, you know, new product offerings, anything in that realm gets you excited. And then I guess as kind of a follow on to that, this is a little bit loaded, but I want to, you know, we're, we're coming up on an hour here. So I want to kind of come to the conclusion of this conversation. Um, with that in mind, you know, for young professionals that are listening to this right now, young audiologists or hearing professionals or people that are just sort of starting out in their career, um, if you were in their shoes, if you were just getting started out, you know, where would you sort of place your bets, if you will, or where would be the aspects within this industry um, specifically that you're really excited about that you would maybe pay a lot of mind to or put some of your focus toward? Again, I know it's a loaded question, a lot going on there. Um, so, oh, go ahead, Carl. No, you go, you go ahead. Yeah. So I would, um, I'm excited about teleaudiology and telepractice. I'm excited about concierge care, where you provide care the way the patient wants to receive care, maybe in their home, maybe in their office, maybe with a hybrid, like Carl talked about, uh, where you don't have a brick and mortar location, where you're really working to and for the patient. There's technologies, whether we're talking about Shoebox, Akutawave, or Autodata, or the Omtos. I mean, there's a lot of technologies that we can use. I'm really excited about the practice of audiology to its fullest extent, especially on the evaluative and the treatment ends that have nothing to do with a widget. Um, and I, you know, I thought about having a practice that I didn't dispense a single hearing aid. And I think that there is viability to that, mm -hmm. that you become the evaluative expert with no skin in this, that you really look um, unbiased. And I think that there is a need for that. I think there is a need for the experts and to practice, not practice everything just, you know, I'm doing some of it, but no, you're an expert in aspects of care and that it's much more than hearing aids. And, you know, to, to that point, the, you know, the, the entire, you know, cradle to grave care, we, we really give short shrift to um, hearing protection a lot of times, but, you know, I mean, that- that's, I forgot that's about that. You know, that's something that, that you know, dentists tell you to brush your teeth and mm -hmm. and, and take care of your, you know, floss and, 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 and you know, come in and we need to be a lot more comprehensive about care. You know, it, it, it really should be cradle to grave care with and talking about, um, at least for audiologists, uh, falls and vestibular and, and, um, and you don't have to do that. You don't necessarily have to do that, but, but you can, you can refer. And right. referrals are, gr are great sources of customers too. So, you know, uh, and tinnitus, you know, uh, the 80-80 rule, you know, 80% of people who have hearing loss have tinnitus and 80% of people with tinnitus have hearing loss. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot of things that, that hearing health care professionals can do um, that, that are, that's comprehensive care, including the mild hearing losses that we had talked about. I think in the future, um, the blended care model offers a huge amount of, of potential for those practices who really want to expand and um, get in. You know, I could I could foresee having hearing technicians, you know, or, or uh, audiology technicians in the back 
helping patients on a full-time basis or even from their offices in, at home, helping, helping patients uh, who want to be helped that way and, and expanding your services. I think Kim would agree that there's a lot of problems we have to um, for, you know, uh, uh, surmount in terms of interstate uh, types of things. And, and she knows a lot more about that than I do, but, uh, you know, teleaudiology is a, is a huge component for us in the future. And if you just look at the number of hearing aid, disp um, not, here, here I go again, hearing aid dispensers, but hearing care professionals um, as, you know, compared to the number of people who possibly need our services and whether, and I'm not just, I'm not, you, you don't even have to talk about mild hearing losses there. Um, we have a, a really relatively small number of, of practices, dispensing practices for a large number of, of people who need, who have significant hearing loss and teleaudiology, if we don't start using it, um, I, I think that's an existential threat. I agree. And I, I also think if we don't uh, um, change our pricing models, if we don't have that hybrid pricing um, patient center type thing, and I think it's an essential threat if we don't better evaluate people because somebody else is going to step. If we keep not doing things, someone's going to step in from outside to take over that realm. That's what's kind of happened with vestibular and PT because we have not taken over that realm. And that's what you're more, I, I, I see so many opportunities, right. but I am not as I, I am not as optimistic as I was before because I've been not seeing people change. Because, because our market is small. And again, I would say our market is small enough. The, the physical practices are, are, are small enough where they don't, there isn't that huge of an impetus to change right now, but when the economics come to be, and it might be too late then, um, it, yeah. it, we, we, we will need to change. Um, you know, but, the, but we're looking at things as largely in a glass half empty context, the opportunities for audiology, there's always going to be, uh, um, in my view, there, there'll always be need for audiology. Here, I, I can't conceive of there not yeah. being people who don't need audiologists um, or, or hearing care professionals. They, they, they'll, they'll need expert fitting. Yes, of the expertise. Yeah, right. they're going to need the expertise, right? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that there is a, there is a half glass empty, half glass full view that you could take on this. Uh, and I understand, Kim, where you're coming from with feeling like it might be half empty based on your previous experiences that I don't want it to be too late and maybe because mm -hmm. I've read some stuff that I mean Amlani has been writing and Victor Bray have been writing about how the window of change is getting smaller and smaller before it does before it does become too late mm -hmm. and there's there's a there's an argument and I, I, we can't get into it but but you know the it's very it's very difficult for it, the expense of getting in becoming an AUD oh, yeah. just is and the payoff compared to it you know we've there's been plenty of Great discussion point. about that that's a huge um, point yeah uh, our our pipeline of professionals is um, is not optimized I 100,000% agree. And there's another place where we've been reluctant to evolve. To, so like if, if I had the perfect AUD program, you would start your AUD program by getting a dispensing license. That's right. how you would start. Right. And then the program would move at the pace of the student. And it wouldn't be in this academic box and you know some people may be able to get out in a year some people it might take four and maybe you grant a master's degree to people who don't want to do things that are greater right. than right. basic audiometry 
and that they have licensure for that. And then you have a different AUD degree for people who have encompassing experiences. But you're right, Carl, that is part of the problem. And again, it's just this been this, there, we meet a lot in audiology. We're really awesome at having meetings and forums. We are fantastic. And then we put together plans that no one executes. We excel at that. I can't be on a committee anymore if we're not going to do anything. That's like really my thing. My, I ask people up front, are we going to do something? Because if there's not an outcome here, I'm out. Right. <laughs> I, right. You got to have an, you got to have an outcome. Um, you got to have an outcome. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that there's definitely, uh, you know, there's going to be challenges that present themselves for this industry. But again, kind of going back to the theme of, I think this episode or this conversation has been largely about the value residing in your expertise. And it's a matter of figuring out how do you monetize that properly? How do you make sure that that is front and center for the industry? And that's where the patients are perceiving your value to be. Because in my mind, that's way harder for any you know outside player to come and disrupt. Um, and I just think that that's going to be where the rubber meets the road here uh, across the next few years is, um, like you said, Kim, it's been a lot of talk. But the, the, the difference in my mind is that um, because of the legislative changes that are coming with you know, OTC, because of uh, what the pandemic has done, I mean, people have to realize that even though telemedicine might be kind of res, you know, falling back into the background in this industry, that's not really the case across broad swaths of the, the medical industry. And, and the patient of today is much different. They're conditioned differently. And so... You can talk all you want, but I think that what's going to happen is you're going to have a few people that really figure it out and they're going to thrive. I think there are going to be some providers out there that completely figure this out. They realize that they're not limited to their zip code. Um, they can have, you know, you can employ technicians to do a lot of the clerical work or almost adopt them to be sort of like the dental hygienist parallel within your model. Um, I think there's a lot of different things that bode really well for the providers out there that take it upon themselves. Uh, and again, I don't want this to sound preachy or anything like that, but I think that whereas there are a lot of different reasons to maybe be a little bit glass half empty with this, I think if you take it upon yourself, there's a lot that's boding really, really well for you. I, in many ways, I think that the provider of today is more empowered by the sort of external environment um, to do really, really well in a way that prior to a lot of these macro you know, elements uh, not really being in play, like these remote services that are really in the forefront of the public's mind now, um, they didn't exist before. And you were kind of limited to that zip code that you lived in. And, and, I, and I know, Dave, that I have been like really negative now, and I'm usually not. <laughs> You're and realistic so though. I 100% I, I agree with everything you said. We have so many opportunities yeah. in front of us. And, and what I would say to someone who's listening, well, I can't make money at that. And my response, not to be rude, is that's bull because mm -hmm. you can. I can monetize anything. Yeah. It's all just about assigning value to your time, assigning yeah. value. What do you need to bring in to break even and make a profit and assigning value to that time? All of this can be monetized. It's all opportunities. It's all things that will make 100%. you the queen or king or an expert in your community. But no one's going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. No one's going to hand it to you. You've got to do the legwork yourself. There's lots of people there to support you, but they're not going to do it for you. You've got to do the work. And from a, from a consumer standpoint, value is, and, and Kochkin showed this in, back in 2004 in market track, value can be defined as percentage benefit divided by price. So in other words, if, if, you, if you provide a little bit of benefit and a, and a, for a little bit of price for somebody who, do, who doesn't have that big of a loss, um, they can perceive that as pretty, pretty high value. Um, you know what? What we tend to always concentrate on is is the is you know a, a lot of a lot a lot of loss and and a lot of benefit for a lot of cost. 
and I think we need to expand that equation and, and understand that, that um, just what you said, Dave and Kim, we've got a, we've got a ton of opportunity. And Warren Buffett said, price is what you pay, but value is what you get. Right. Well, and the thing too, with this, with this particular type of solution, it, it has to be one of the biggest word of mouth marketing, you know, type of products out there. Because again, going back to this value piece, if you can give somebody that's that like being able to hear the river again, or the stream, like you said, Carl, um, and you know, they've, maybe they only paid a couple of thousand dollars or less. Um, I mean, in their mind, you've just restored all, uh, one of their senses. And so I think that we sort of undersell the value that this is providing. And I think that that is crucial to understand to why I think this is, you know, when you can grow the market, when you make more people, um, you expose them to this value and this benefit, um, it's only going to grow the market because you have that many more advocates in the market that are advocating not only on behalf of the technology and then this awesome new solution that they've gotten, but they're going to bat for you. They're going and they're saying, yeah, this is the person that fit me. And maybe they're, they're not even in my zip code. I just did a whole consultation online and they mailed me the device or however this is going to look in the next, you know, coming years. Uh, it just seems to me like, again, you, you, you have a lot of things going really well for you right now. I think so too. And, and also it gives some great opportunities to providers to be able to practice more flexibly, yes. especially if they have, you know, commitments outside of work. I mean, there's a lot of, I always tell people concierge care is a great model if you want to have a lot more control over your life. And like I have a colleague here in Illinois, a fantastic, who's a concierge audiologist and never closed one day for COVID. Because when you're in concierge, you have to have PPE anyway. So she mm. already had all of this stuff. She was raring to go. <laughs> and so she just was going to what, where people needed. And, and on her own time frame, what kind of awesome life is that? <laughs> For sure. It's a win for everybody. I love wins. Like how can everybody win? Yeah. And I want the manufacturers to win. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Well, Kim, Carl, this has been unbelievably awesome. I can't thank you two enough for coming on, sharing your knowledge um, and, and your perspective uh, that you've sort of gained over the years of, of being in this industry. It's just so cool to hear all these past experiences and, um, you know, kind of like how things have changed and, and, and where we are today. Um, I learned a lot here. I think the audience did as well. So thank you two very much for coming on. Thanks for everybody who tuned in here to the end and we will chat with you next time. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. That was fun.